most of the people they are downloading data from, you will find out that most of the uh, Chinese coordinates you have there are just coordinates of the country. So how do you how do you reconcile that if you I mean to, to develop your models with uh, uh, geo references that are not accurate? Good, good question. I mean, at, at the end of the day, again, your models can only be as good as the data that you're feeding into it. So there's going to be a subjective decision there in terms of, you know, is is can I get can I get this georeference accurate enough that it is useful in my particular application? Um, if the only if the best option is is a country, then um, that in most cases is probably not simply is simply not going to be useful data. But what you might have is that. Maybe you can trace that back. You can actually go to the museum, get the specimen, look at the label, and, and maybe there's some more information on there. But yeah, I mean, there's no there's no easy answer to that. In effect, I don't know if Tony wanted to add anything from a knowledge of these. So it's quite a uh, intense field right now. And in fact, later in the biodiversity and genetics training curriculum, we're probably going to do a full week on on georeferencing. Um, it all depends on the original record. If there's enough information in fields like country, state, county, locality, directions from locality. And the question is how much can you extract from that in terms of precise coordinates and also a good understanding of the spatial uncertainty around those coordinates. But it's certainly a question that to do rigorously requires a week or two of training. Um, to do it enough for a research project requires perhaps less training. Suffice it to say for right now that there are a lot of um, global gazetteers and regional or national gazetteers that give you indexes to names. So for example, um, where is Nairobi, Kenya? Here are the coordinates. Of course, then you have to deal with the fact that Nairobi, Kenya is probably tens of kilometers in diameter, but a lot of the places that will be referred to are much smaller. So, big, big field, big, difficult field. One of the major challenges ahead for GIGA is precisely that, getting detailed, documented uh, coordinates and uncertainty estimates for as many records in that data available through that data portal as is possible. Not at all. Okay. Thanks, Tom. I think I think one of the really important points there was simply about the important point is, is is knowing, having some estimate of what the uncertainty is. What you don't want to be doing is just assuming that you're right within a centimeter when that's probably not the case. And there are things if you think, you know, there are things that you can start doing with your particular application that might say well, I know that, um, say, there's probably 10 kilometers uncertainty here. So I have a record, but you, you might, you know, draw 10 kilometers around it, and then you might do some experiments. Like, you could subsample within that 10 kilometer level of uncertainty and start asking whether, how much influence that has on your models. And if you're in some environments where within that 10 kilometers, well, there's not that much difference in the environment, so the models are getting the same information, then maybe you can accept the 10 kilometers of uncertainty. If you're working in the Alps or the Andes when uh, over 10 kilometers the environment might change hugely, then you might get very different models, so that would be an uncertain, you know, too, too much uncertainty. So the, the, there are ways to start thinking through as well for your particular application, you know, is there too much uncertainty? Is, is, can I work with it? And start thinking outside the box, if you like, in terms of, you know, um, how to deal with some of these issues.